Warning, this episode contains mentions of animal violence, descriptions of child abuse, hard drugs, and other content that may not be suitable for some listeners. In the description of this episode are timestamps for each story, including their warnings for safe listening. Listener discretion is advised. There's a fucking car going by. <laughs> My phone vibrated. Let me turn that off. Strong start, just gotta say. Excellent. <laughs> Great start right up top. Welcome to the Everyday Nightmares podcast. I'm assuming you didn't bring a nut. You know, damn well I didn't bring a nut. You did not bring a nut. I do not appreciate your puns. I would say so. You can make them, but you don't really make puns that often. I make puns all the time. Do you? Yeah. (laughs) It's been a while since we recorded, to be fair. It's only been an extra, like, three days. Than usual. Okay. I I guess that's a lot. My only sense of time is, um, away at boarding school, so. Set alarms. I do. Yeah. I, uh, I can't even say anything. I feel that. Have I ever said corn nut? Yes. Damn it. As soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, I've said this, actually. Oh, what? This is uh, the Welcome to the Podcast, where we discuss the true the true crime and the bat nuts! Bat nuts! Thank you oh, so much. I realize how that sounds. I'm gonna send you a picture. Of bat nuts. Not, You're gonna no, send me- not- Okay, listen, listen to me. They're nuts- and they're in the shape of bats. They're not the animal's nutsack, okay? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. a pinky promise. Oh, and it's also known as water caltrops, which I may have said before. You've said. Motherfucker! They look like mustaches, too. That's cute. Have I ever said tiger nut? No. <laughs> well. This is the podcast where we dis- every day where we discuss the true crime and the tiger nuts. Tiger nuts. Thank you. No problem, problem. I'm Sammy Madden. And I'm Dan Sly. And this week's episode topic is predictions. Yeah! Predictions. And, uh... It's been like 80 degrees consistently, and then it was 50, so that sucked. Is that is that your banter? Is That's that your opening banter. banter? Yeah, yeah, we're talking about the weather. I uh, uh, I don't have air conditioning in my room. It didn't suck for me. Cooler. It took me a minute to process what you said. I was like, how would air conditioning... How would not having air conditioning not suck? And then I, I it processed. Um, it was nice being able to go out in shorts and a t-shirt or tank top. And then I was in, like, leggings and a jacket again. Tired of it. We live in Michigan. You should get used to it. I, I'm never not going to complain about the weather. Okay. <laughs> I, like, no matter where you live. No, no, just about Michigan's weather, at least. Probably no matter where I live. But, like, it's just... I noticed from working in the service industry that it's a fucking thing for people here just to be, like, commenting on the weather consistently. Like, it's so nice out today. Can't believe you have to work! And then, if it's, you know, a really shitty day, they're like, wow, it's so cold. It was so warm yesterday, though. Like, people, that's just how we say hello sometimes. It's just talk about how good or shitty the weather is or has been. I hated people who would come through the drive-thru when it was raining out. I worked in retail, so it was different for me. It was, I got exposed to the elements no matter what it was, because I was always on back window. Uh, yeah, there was that, that one sucks. time 
where I had my hoodie under my work shirt and it hadn't dried all the way and it was November. Oh, I remember you telling me about that. Yeah. That's fucked up. They should at least provide rain ponchos. They provided, like, jackets, but it, I had to clean my work uniform and my dryer never gets the clothes, like, dry the first cycle. But I had to oh, work. I gotcha. Yeah, I definitely went to work in wet pants one time. Yeah, and then I got there and my manager at the time was like, you could have just told me you were going to be late. And I was like, well, you know, here I am with wet pants. Don't know what to do now. <laughs> like, thank you so much. I Yeah, really thank you very much. That and I um, go. Are you going to let me go home now then so that I can wash my pants? Finish drying my pants. It was basically like the washer just never emptied. And so I threw my, I threw that single pair of pants into the dryer trying to like dry it super fast, but they were like drenched because the washer never emptied and I didn't look at it until right before work because I did that all the time and it was never like a problem mm -hmm. until it was. <laughs> I don't have a good transition. This is probably the worst banter we've ever had. <laughs> I agree. I'm inclined to agree. <laughs> Has anything funny happened to you this week? Um, when we dropped Choco off, he looked like, it looked like a big Burmese mountain dog wanted to come make friends with him. She was fucking huge, but, uh, he was scared. Well, that's cute. He I'm sorry scared. he was scared, but, uh, that's adorable. She looked real friendly. Oh my gosh. I love animals so much. I... Uh, my cat this week gave us a pregnancy scare. What? She looked real sriracha. Oh. She has a son named Tabasco, by the way. They're very friendly and lovable. Uh, Tabasco will run under your feet because he wants you to pet him. It's adorable, though. Anyway. She got real fat. So we were like, damn, she's gotta be pregnant. And then the next day... She wasn't as fat. And we were like, oh shit. What happened? And we looked everywhere for babies and have not found any? What the fuck? So, we think she's pregnant. We have identified that, because she's been looking for, like, an area to, like, nest and, like, give birth, basically. And she's also been slapping Tabasco, which is very out of character for her. She's not making milk yet. But, we like, I found where she was nesting, and I didn't find any babies. No sign that she gave birth anywhere. So. There weren't babies, but we thought that there were. So, a birth scare, not a pregnancy scare. Thank you, I didn't know how to word it. It's okay. Yeah. Because she is pregnant, so that fear is confirmed. Yeah, for sure. Well, it's not really fear, I love kittens. I know. I don't know, the funniest thing to happen today was literally, I recently got diagnosed with BPD, and my therapist was like, well, we need to work on handling your interpersonal relationships, because people with borderline can tend to think in very black and white, where some person is all good, and then the next day they're, like, all bad, and they split and hate everyone. And I had to be like, okay, this already happens. It has happened with you before, and I know how to manage it, but thank you so much for that being a concern of yours after five years of coming to you. <laughs> well, you know, it's just... I don't hate my therapist. I know how to manage my interpersonal relationships to a decent extent. Yeah. It was just funny to me. Because I was it like, oh, funny. I'm doing I'm doing better than I thought I was. <laughs> she was yeah, like, so the next great. step on this journey, and I'm like, I'm already doing that step. Thank you, though. Well, okay, part of it, though, is you told me that she had suspected that you had BPD, but she wanted a psychiatrist to diagnose you. She didn't want to bring it up until you were diagnosed with it. So uh -huh. maybe it's something she was, like, holding on to for when you got that diagnosis. 
<laughs> that joke? Like, it's just... No, 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 not even a joke. Just that tool for you specifically. She's been holding on to it, but didn't realize that you were already doing it. Because she's probably been, like, coaxing you in the right direction. Because she suspected you had it. Yeah. And you also do a lot of your own research and, like, into yeah. just mental health altogether. I suspected I had it, brought it up once to one of my friends, and was really hoping it was autism or ADHD and not an entire trauma response of a personality disorder. But. What happened? I was, there are overlapping symptoms between BBT, BPD, autism, mm. and ADHD. I suspected I had something called quiet BPD. Um, which is instead of, like, lashing out, you tend to withdraw more when the fear of abandonment gets triggered. But I was hoping it was autism or ADHD, because the only thing for BPD is, like, therapy, and ADHD at least has medicine. Yeah. My psychiatrist told me I had a bad childhood, and I was like, damn, I knew that deep down, but you didn't have to say it like that. <laughs> it, it was very much that Bob's Burgers moment of, I just realized something, I had a bad childhood, and Linda going, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know. Look at you. What do you mean, look at me? Look at how you stand. People who had good childhoods don't stand like that. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I haven't been keeping up with Bob's Burgers, but I fucking love that show. I always think of uh, our moderator. We've said his name and our moderator in the same sentence before, so... Our friend Brent, who's also our Hi, moderator, Brent. fucking <coughs> loves Bob's... Bob... Bob Burger. <laughs> <laughs> fucking loves Bob's Burgers. And we love him. We do. Very much. Me and him have matching Coochie Kopi nightlights. <laughs> my mom also has one actually she also really loves bob's burgers i uh when i don't know what to get him that's always what i go to bob's burgers her favorite yeah. character is louise which is silly because she said that louise reminds me reminds her of me so i guess she basically said i'm her favorite child but you know <laughs> <laughs> So today's episode of Psychics, uh, Sammy has already mentioned, and I- I uh, thought it was just predictions. Oh, it is. You're right. Uh, I misspoke. Anyway, Thank God, so because I'm I was going to doing... shit myself. <laughs> no, no, it's definitely predictions. Um, if I'm being honest, when I was trying to look for, for something along the lines, I wasn't finding what I wanted. And so this is the only thing that didn't bore the shit out of me. So I'm talking about a particular person who made predictions, kind of? Very loosely followed the assignment. That's okay, me too. Perfect. As usual, I feel like we... For Easter, we presented each other massacres. I think we're fine. Yeah, and for alligators, one of us did a death, and the other one... When alligator <laughs> takes a nap in a taco <laughs> drive through <laughs> Alright, so I got my inspiration from Blurry Photos, the podcast, and Astonishing Legends, the podcast. They both had episodes on this particular person. <laughs> I totally went to the next line and I was like, did I not write down my sources? But I did. Okay. My sources are Britannica.com, Wikipedia, and edgarcasey.org haha <laughs> that's totally not his name so my today so today I'm talking about the sleeping prophet Edgar Casey. okay <laughs> alright uh, so yeah I'm just talking about one person in particular it's actually way longer than I expected it to be Edgar Casey was an American self-proclaimed faith healer and psychic so I guess I'm technically talking about a psychic but he made predictions I mean, don't most psychics generally? Well, you know what? Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Like, I think you're... Are you conflating psychic and mind reader? 
No. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. That's he was born March... <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. He Is was born March... Pisces? 18? March 18th. Yes. Really? Yeah, and funnily enough, psych- uh, Pisces are known for being the intuitives of the Zodiac. Ooh, interesting. Um, If he wasn't a bitch who wasn't, like, 18, usually what I see is 17 to 24 are the days where the sun sign is liable to change. Okay, gotcha. But, um, just so that you know, he's actually a really nice guy, nothing like the other Pisces that we, you know, we knew. We refer to them as fish bitches, so sorry, everyone. Uh, mostly just that one. We don't really know I know anybody. multiple. Ah, I probably do too and just don't know that they're Pisces, but we call this particular one fish bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Fish bitch boy, to be exact. Fish bitch boy. <laughs> All right. Um, I, some Pisces placements are absolutely wonderful. Do you want to put that out there? It's usually Pisces sun men. Well, he is that. Edgar Casey is that. <laughs> we'll get into why I like him though. Like it's gonna take a little bit to get there, but he's very nice. kind, very kind-hearted. Okay. I trust you. All right. He was born for the seventh time, March 18th, 1877, in Beverly, which is a town south of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. I have no idea where that is. I the, I don't even know Hopkinsville is a big city. It was just on Britannica, so I said it. <laughs> okay. So I hope this makes sense to you people in Kentucky. He was one of six children of farmers, Carrie Elizabeth. And Leslie Burr Casey. As a child, he was alleged to have seen his deceased grandfather. He regarded what he saw as incorporeal because he could see through it if he looked hard enough. That's terrifying. Very. He was considered weird by his classmates and not very popular among them. Edgar Casey found it difficult to keep his mind on his lessons at school and was described as being not very intelligent. Hmm. Yeah. His father often scolded him for it and forced Edgar to spend his evenings studying. I do want to say some of, like, those kids that were, like, stereotypically dumb, like, the teachers would always get on their shit and stuff for being, like, for being, like, loudmouth. Like, one-on-one -on -one conversations, they could be some of the nicest people. Yeah. To me, at least. I think they're acting out because they feel inadequate. Probably. He was taken to church when he was ten, and from then he read the Bible, becoming engrossed, and completed a dozen readings by the time he was twelve. In May 1889, while reading the Bible in his hut in the woods, he saw a woman with wings his who what? told- <laughs> His what? His hut! He can't just- <laughs> He can't just blast over that! <laughs> He just made a little fort in the woods. I've never done it, but I've, like, I guess I've only seen that shit in, like, movies and stuff, but I, I enjoy the idea of it. And, you know, in the woods behind my house, not, not just any woods. He saw a woman with wings who told him that his prayers were answered and asked him what he wanted most of all. He was frightened, but he said that most of all he wanted to help others, especially sick children. He decided he would like to be a missionary. The next night, after a complaint from the school teacher, his father ruthlessly tested him for spelling, eventually knocking him out of his chair with exasperation. At that point, Edgar heard the voice of the lady who had appeared the day before. She told him that if he could sleep a little, that they could help him. He begged for a rest and put his head on his spelling book. When his father came back into the room and woke him up, he knew all of the answers. In fact, he could repeat anything in the book. His father thought he had been fooling before and knocked him out of the chair again. What the fuck? Yeah, he's an asshole. But also, he absorbed it through osmosis. I'm 90... I just got the worst deja vu. I think that one of the other podcasts made that exact same joke. 
<laughs> I'm like, I think it was blurry photos, if I'm remembering correctly. It was um, one of the two. There's a 50-50 chance I got it right. But someone definitely made that joke. The thing is, I stole that from a Tumblr post. So. Okay. <laughs> what was the Tumblr post? Uh, it was actually about how that would be the incorrect terminology for sleeping with your textbook under your pillow. I can't remember the actual scientifically scientific term, but it's not osmosis. Ah. Well, uh, y- you basically just outed one of these podcasts for using Tumblr. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I mean, it's better than TikTok. I will, uh... Wait, um, you're not on the sides of TikTok, I am. Is there a good side of Tumblr, though? Like, I know there are bad uh, sides of TikTok, but there are good sides of TikTok. And I... Yes, and it's the people who don't post anything but fan art and photos, and don't say anything. No thoughts, head empty. Oh! Just aesthetics. Perfect, um... I want memes! <laughs> I just want memes in every format on one website. Which is what Tumblr could be for me if it didn't suck. Facebook is actually where I get most of mine. Oh, the people on Facebook make me so mad, though. Oh yeah, I have to trample through a lot of lesbophobia to get any good lesbian memes. But! <sighs> <laughs> There's no after the but, it's just that I'm so sorry to anyone on lesbian Facebook. I know it sucks. Or Twitter. Or TikTok. Or Tumblr. Or Instagram. Happy Pride Month, (laughs) guys! We are so sorry, but happy Pride Month. We forgot to talk about it last week, I think that... Yeah. Alligator Crimes just came out. So this is technically the first episode during Pride Month. So, uh, happy Pride Month, everyone. Happy Pride Month. So sorry to start it off with that thing. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, I I meant to say something about it, but then I didn't make any note of it. Uh, so I completely forgot. But you you bringing up lesbophobia really reminded me that it was Pride Month. (laughs) 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 Alright, I'm gonna keep going, though. (laughs) He continued this practice, and after three years, was regarded by his teacher as being his best student. When he was questioned, Edgar told the teacher that he saw pictures of the pages in the books. His father became proud of this accomplishment and spread it around, resulting in Casey becoming different from his peers. So everyone used to make fun of him, and now they're like, Wow, he's the best. Eh, kids switch up. Yeah, I know. But, like, they were all so mean to him before, and his father was fucking mean to him. And then suddenly his dad's like... Oh, his father was just straight up abusive. Yeah. And now his dad's like, oh, I'm so proud of my boy! He's so smart, I raised that. You yeah, a little bit of a cunt. Are. All right. Soon after this, Edgar was struck on the base of his spine by a ball in a school game, after which he began to act very strangely and eventually was put to bed. He went to sleep and diagnosed the cure which his family prepared, and it cured him as he slept. I just want to say, the cure that he prepared was all stuff that wasn't going to harm him. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't find out exactly what it was, but just imagine that he was like, I just need some tea, some ginger, some honey, whatever. Nothing bad. Yeah, nothing bad, which is why his family gave it to him. (laughs) He wasn't, like, eight years old and like, hey guys, I need some cocaine. (laughs) I need arsenic. (laughs) Got any strychnine left over, mom? (laughs) Any cyanide? (laughs) Has crack been invented yet? Like, that, well, I don't know, when was Coca-Cola invented? That was a joke, that was me, like, Coca-Cola had cocaine in it, not crack. 
Cocaine is like the fancy way to say crack. It's crack cocaine. Ah, I'm pretty sure they're two different things. Yeah, I was about to say, one of them's like... No, nope. went through a different process. The difference is how you're able to do it, huh. how you're able to ingest it. Yeah, yeah. So it is what I thought that it was. Cocaine is hydrochloride salt and its powdered form, whereas crack cocaine is derived from powdered cocaine by combining it with water and other substances. So you add shit to cocaine to make it crack. Ah, okay. Yeah. Which is weird, because cocaine sounds fancy. Cocaine? Shut up. <laughs> well, cocaine's like its purer form. I suppose. But anyway, the joke was supposed to be that eight-year-old Edgar was saying, has crack been invented yet? But I think it went over your head. So it I'm going to keep reading. <laughs> his father boasted that his son was the greatest fellow in the world when he's asleep. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't that funny to me when I wrote it, but that's fucking hilarious. <laughs> My son is fantastic when he's unconscious. <laughs> However, this ability was not demonstrated again for several years. Edgar worked on a farm as a child. Uh, well, his parents were farmers, so yeah. That tracks. <laughs> that sure does. Uh, but he worked on a different farm, I think. I don't know. The timelines were a little fucky. But anyway, so there's this other weird story that I'm going to tell you. He worked on a different farm and was no longer living in the same town as, as his mom. I don't I don't know. Uh, don't know the specifics, but here we go. Okay. One day, he felt a presence that was familiar to him. They said, go back to your mother. She misses you. You're her best friend. Then he rode a certain mule back to the farmhouse at the end of the workday. This stunned everyone there, as that particular mule could not be ridden. The owner, thinking it may be time to break the animal in again, attempted to mount it, but was immediately thrown off. That night in 1893, Edgar left his town to meet his family in Hopkinsville. So, he's also a Disney princess. <laughs> well, there are definitely just certain animals that take to certain people more. That's true. Bubbles likes you and no one else. And Brent. Actually. She likes Jacob. That's true. I don't see Fucking Jacob. Fucking hates a lot, my so. brother, though. You don't see Brent a lot either. Yes, but every time you mention who Bubbles likes, you always mention Brent. You don't mention Jacob. Oh. As far she as likes as him. far as I remember. Huh. Well, she likes Brent and Jacob. Hates my brother, though. He, uh, she's really nice to him for the first couple minutes, but he's got other animals, too. And then after she smells him for a minute, she kind of gets upset. Oh, so kind of like me. <laughs> what? Why would you say that? Hey, you seem all what? right. Wait a minute. I smell that you have a dog at home. I hate you now. Well, Bubbles, it... Bubbles is always hit or miss with me. Yeah, I think she just really hates when you don't smell like... I don't know. It must be when you smell like other animals, because Brent doesn't have other animals, and Jacob doesn't interact with the animals that he lives with very much. Yeah, so that would make sense. Yeah, I think it's just got to do with if you have other pets. Unless you smell like her, I'll have to get some bubbles pheromone not... and spray them on your hands or something. That's okay, thanks, though. <laughs> During his time in Hopkinsville, Edgar received an 8th grade education and left the family farm to pursue various forms of employment. Casey's education stopped in the ninth grade because his family could not afford the costs involved. A ninth grade education was considered more than sufficient for working-class children at the time. Much of the remainder of Casey's younger years would be spent characterized by a search for employment. On March 14th, 1897, Casey became engaged to Gertrude Evans. Throughout his life, Casey was drawn to church as a member of the Disciples of Christ. He read the entire Bible once a year, every year, attended church, taught Sunday school, and recruited missionaries. He said he could see auras around people. 
In his early years, he agonized over whether these prophetic abilities were spiritually delivered from the highest source. Or as opposed to what? Devil given? Just average. Is it a gift uh, from God or is it just a skill certain people have? <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's the only thing I can think. Maybe it's a curse? I don't know. I don't know. In one story, Edgar was waiting for an elevator. When the doors opened, he saw that everyone on the elevator had a black aura. He decided not to get on the elevator and said he'd wait. The elevator cable was reported to have snapped and everyone on the elevator passed away. Oh, that sounds like the room from one more story from Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. Do you remember that one? Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark? The room for one more. No. What is that? There's a car, I believe it starts with the car, and the people inside say room for one more. And then it's, I think it's a bus, and they say room for one more, and then it, the last one I think is an elevator, and they say room for one more. And it's the same group of people every time, and uh, he doesn't get on, and the elevator falls. Hmm. Well... Either this story is fake, or it inspired that story. I'm guessing it's the second thing. I enjoy that, actually. Yeah. I wonder if that's also where you got, like, people get the sleep on your textbook thing. Could be. Alright, continuing. In the year 1900, Edgar Casey formed a business partnership with his father to sell woodmen... Of the world insurance. However, in March, he was struck by severe laryngitis that resulted in a complete loss of speech. Laryngitis is the inflammation of the voice box from overuse, irritation, or infection. Viral, infle bleh, viral infections are the most common cause of laryngitis. I got that information from Mayo Clinic. I hope it's Mayo, because... The only other way I can it's think to mayo. say that is mayo <laughs> from the mayonnaise clinic. Unable to work, he lived at home with his parents for almost a year. He then decided to take up the trade of photography, as it was an occupation that would exert less strain on his voice. He began an apprenticeship at the photography studio of W.R. Bulls in Hopkinsville and eventually became quite talented. Okay. <laughs> After reading this, I looked for his photography to see if he was actually good. Like, I wanted to see if his photography was good. Then I remember that this was the early 1900s, so I couldn't tell at all. I'm sure it was good by 1900 standards. I don't know what I was expecting. <laughs> but uh, it's nice, just really Danny. old portraits. Yeah, thank you. I looked it up and I was like, huh, this looks like shit. Because it's from a camera like <laughs> more than 100 years ago. <laughs> In 1901, a traveling hypnotist and entertainer named Hart, who referred to himself as the Laugh Man, was performing at Hopkinsville Opera House. <laughs> they call me the Laugh Man. Who calls you that? I do. <laughs> Hart heard about Edgar's throat condition and offered to attempt a cure. Edgar accepted his offer, and the experiment was conducted in the office of Manning Brown, the local throat specialist. <coughs> Edgar's voice was a l Are you laughing at throat specialist? <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm laughing at throat specialist. The local throat specialist. The local really does something <laughs> for me. Yeah, that's that's fair. Edgar's voice allegedly returned while in a hypnotic trance, but then disappeared when he woke. Hart tried a post-hypnotic suggestion that the voice would continue to function after the trance, but this proved useless. Since Hart had appointments in other cities, he could not continue Edgar's hypnotic treatments, but admitted he had failed because Edgar would not go into the third stage of hypnosis to take a suggestion. A New York hypnotist, John... <laughs> John Duncan Quackenboss. <laughs> no. <laughs> found
on the same <laughs> impediment, but after returning to New York, suggested that Edgar should be prompted to take over his own case while in the second stage of hypnosis. The only local hypnotist, Al Lane, offered to help Edgar Casey restore his voice. In subsequent squash. <laughs> That was real bad. In subsequent sessions, when Edgar wanted to indicate that the connection was made to the person or the entity that was requesting the reading, he would generally start off with, we have the body. After 20 minutes, Edgar, still in a trance, declared the treatment over. On awakening, his voice was alleged to have returned to normal. Relapses did occur, but were said to have been corrected by Lane in the same way, and eventually the cure was permanent. Al Lane asked Edgar to describe Lane's own ailments and suggest cures. Edgar did, and Lane found the results to be both accurate and effective. Lane suggests that Edgar offer his trance healing to the public. Edgar was reluctant as he wasn't actually sure what he was prescribing because he was asleep for the process and wondered if his remedies were safe. Edgar finally began to offer his trance to the healing public, but would refuse to accept payment as he only wanted to help people. Edgar started his healing and free treatments with Al Lane's help. Lane described Edgar Casey's method as a self-imposed hypnotic trance, which induces clairvoyance. Reports of Casey's work have appeared in the newspapers, which inspired many postal inquiries, and Edgar stated he could work just as effectively using a letter from the individual as with the person being present in the room. Given only the person's name and location, Edgar said he could diagnose the physical and mental conditions of what he termed the entity, and then provide a remedy. Edgar was still worried, as one dead patient was all he needed to become a murderer. That was a quote from him. Fair enough. Yeah. His fiance Gertrude Evans, agreed with him. Few people knew what he was up to. There was a common belief at the time that subjects of hypnosis eventually went insane, or at least that their health suffered. Hmm. Edgar soon became famous, and people from around the world sought his advice through correspondence. Edgar and Gertrude married on June 17, 1903, and she moved to Bowling Green with him, where they had three children, Hugh Lynn, Milton Porter, and Edgar Evans. Hmm. Lane revealed the activity of the professionals at the boarding house, one of whom was a magistrate and journalist. State medical authorities then forced Lane to close his practice. He left to acquire osteopathic qualifications in Franklin. Edgar and Gertrude accepted the resulting publicity as best they could, greatly aided by the diplomacy of young doctors. Edgar and a relative opened a photography studio in Bowling Green, while the doctors formed a committee with some colleagues to investigate the phenomenon, with Edgar's cooperation. All the experiments confirmed the accuracy of his readings. However, Edgar refused a lucrative offer to go into business. After a violent examination by doctors while in a trance, Edgar refused any more investigations, declaring that he would only do readings for those who needed help and believed in the readings. Violent examination? Yeah, there weren't really any details on that. That's all that it said. Okay. So I don't know in what way it was violent. When a reporter contacted Edgar, he explained to the reporter that he somehow had the ability to easily go into intuitive sleep when he wanted to, and this was different from how he went to sleep normally, like everyone else. When asked about the mechanisms of the readings via the sleep method... They were told that it happened via the capabilities of the subconscious mind. (laughs) Wesley H. Ketchum, which is the first time I've ever actually heard a person have the last name Ketchum. Unfortunate. (laughs) Well, you know. A doctor. Wesley H. Ketchum was a doctor (laughs) that Edgar worked with at the time, again urged Edgar to join business company. To join a business. To join a business company. That's how it's worded. I don't know why. Yeah. 
to start to start a business. We'll, we'll say that. After soul searching the entire night, Edgar finally accepted to the offer under certain conditions, including that he did not take money for his readings. Gertrude became fatally ill with tuberculosis. They used the readings after the doctor had given up. Remaculously. <laughs> Miraculously, the treatment cured her. Shortly after this, in 1912, Edgar, whose everyday conscious mind was not aware of during the readings, discovered that Ketchum had not been honest about them and had also used them to gamble for finance. He argued in defense that the medical profession was not backing them. Edgar quit the company immediately and went back to the Tressler Photography Firm in Selma, Alabama. In the 19-teens, Edgar's popularity as the Sleeping Prophet grew. He was now doing readings regularly, but still never changed... Nope. But still never charged anyone for his services. He would only ask for voluntary donations to support his family. He invented a card game called Pit or Board of Trade around this time for additional income. The game simulated wheat market trading and became popular, but when he sent his idea to a game company, they copyrighted it and he got no returns. What the fuck? I know, that really fucking sucked. The growing fame of Edgar, along with the popularity he received from newspapers, attracted several eager, commercially-minded men who wanted to seek a fortune by using his clairvoyant abilities. Even though Edgar was reluctant to help them, he was persuaded to give his readings, which left him dissatisfied with himself and unsuccessful. A cotton merchant offered him hundreds of dollars a day for his readings about the daily outcomes of the cotton market. However, despite his poor finances, Edgar refused the merchant's offers. Some wanted to know where to hunt for treasures, while others wanted to know the outcome of horse races. In 1923, Arthur Lamers, a wealthy printer... Printer must have been a job, right? I would think. <laughs> Just the way that this sounded when it came out of my mouth was a little bit silly. It was probably a job and student of metaphysics persuaded Edgar to give readings on philosophical subjects. Edgar was told by Lamers that while in his trance state, he spoke of Lamers' past lives and of reincarnation, something Lamers believed in. Reincarnation was a popular subject of the day, but is not accepted as part of Christian doctrine. Because of this, Edgar questioned his stenographer about what he said in his trance state and remained unconvinced. Well, yeah, because he was devout. Yeah. He challenged Lamers' charge that he had validated astrology and reincarnation in the following dialogue. Casey, I said all that? I couldn't have said all that in one reading. Lamers, no, but you confirmed it. You see, I've been studying metaphysics for years, and I was able by a few questions, by the facts you gave, to check what is right and what is wrong with a whole lot of the stuff I've been reading. The important thing is that the basic system, which runs through all the religions, is backed up by you. Edgar's stenographer Gladys recorded the following. In this, we see a plan of development of those individuals set upon plane, set upon this plane, meaning the ability to enter again into the presence of the creator and become a full part of that creation. Insofar as the entity is concerned, this is the third appearance on this plane. And before this one, as the monk, we see glimpses in the life of the entity now as we are shown in the monk in this mode of living. The body is the only vehicle ever that the spirit and soul that waft through all times and ever remain the same. I don't actually know if his name is Lamers or Lammers. I could have been saying his name wrong the entire time. Oh well. Oh well. Lamers convinced Edgar to move to Dayton, Ohio, to preserve metaphysical truth via the readings. Arthur Lamers wanted to ask the purpose of the readings of Edgar's clairvoyance and to put up money for an organization supporting Edgar's healing methods. Edgar decided to accept the work and asked his family to join him in Dayton as soon as they could. By the time the Casey's had arrived there, near the end of 1923, Lamers found himself in financial difficulty and could be of no use. 
It was at this time Edgar directed his activities to provide readings centered around health. The remedies that were channeled often involved the use of unusual electrotherapy, ultraviolet light, diet, massage, less mental work, and more relaxation in the sand on the beach. His remedies were coming under the scrutiny of the American Medical Association, and Edgar felt that it was time to legitimize the operations with the aid of licensed medical practitioners. In 1925, Edgar reported, while in a trance, the voice had instructed him to move to Virginia Beach, Virginia, across the street from the beach. A lot of beaches. A lot of beaches. He was informed that the sand's crystals would have curative properties and promote rapid healing. Edgar created several institutions that can be considered to have started in 1925. By this time, he was a professional psychic with a small number of employees and volunteers. The readings increasingly came to involve occult or esoteric themes. Gertrude Casey began to conduct all the readings. Morton Blumenthal, a young man who worked in the stock exchange in New York with his trader brother, became very interested in the readings, shared Edgar's outlook, and offered to finance the vision in the right spirit. He bought them a house on Virginia Beach. Spiritual sugar daddy. <laughs> on May 6, 1927, the Association of National Investigations once incorporated in the state of Virginia. This would manage the building of the hospital and a scientific study of the readings. Morton was the president, and his brother and several others were vice president. Edgar was secretary and treasurer, and Gladys, the person who records the readings. The stenographer, I remember yeah. her. <laughs> okay. Was assistant secretary. To protect against legal prosecution, the rules required any person requesting a reading to become a member of the association and agree that they were participating in an experiment in psychic research. On October 11th, 1928, which is National Coming Out Day, ah, nice, the dedication ceremonies for the hospital complex were held. It contained a lecture hall, library, vault for storage of the readings, and offices for research workers. There was also a large living room and a 12-car garage, servants' quarters, and a tennis court. It contained the largest lawn, in fact, the only lawn between the Cavalier and Cape Henry. The first patient was admitted the next day. This faculty would enable consistent checking and rechecking of the remedies, which was Edgar's goal. There were consistent remedies for many of the illnesses, regardless of the patient. Edgar hoped to produce a compendium that could be used by the medical profession. A chemist, Sunker A. Bisley, who also used clairvoyant knowledge to produce medicines, collaborated with Edgar to produce atomidine, an absorbable form of iodine, which was perfected and sold. Some of the therapies Edgar prescribed were salt packs, poultices, <laughs> hot compresses, color healing, magnetism, I definitely copy and paste of this list, and I didn't pay attention to this. Vibrator treatment. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Massaging. <laughs> Massage. Osteopath what? Osteopathic manipulation. Dental therapy. <laughs> Colonics? I don't know what the fuck that is. Enemas. <laughs> Antiseptics, inhalants, homeopathics, essential inhalants? oils, and mud baths. Yes, inhalants. Okay. You got a headache. Smell this sharpie. <laughs> don't do inhalants. Some of those can kill you off one hit. That was a joke. Please don't do drugs. Sharpies. Don't do sharpies for sure. Don't inhale anything. Just, it's probably real bad for you. Stop breathing. <laughs> well, you know what? Don't do whippets. Substances used included oils, salts, herbs, iodine, witch hazel, magnesia, bismuth, alcohol, castoria, lactated pepsin, 
Not sure what that is. Turpentine, charcoal, animated ash. Uh, for people on antidepressants, be careful with charcoal. Charcoal can, because you can get like black water, which is charcoal, and charcoal is supposed to be like good for your teeth. Charcoal interacts poorly with a lot of medications. And basically flushes your system. Charcoal? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. Soda. (laughs) So crack? Soda! Not necessarily crack. It could have been the other soda at the time. I I don't know what else. I don't know. Could have been sparkling water and they called that soda. Uh huh. I think yeah. they prescribed cocaine. Which one was in Coke? I'm assuming cocaine. Cocaine. 90% sure. Yeah, two key ingredients in Coca Cola was cocaine and caffeine. Wow, I'm surprised more people didn't die of heart attacks back then. So, I'm 90% sure that. I, I saw a video recently that of someone talking about the history of vaccines, and I'm 90% sure that they said towards the end of the 1800s is when vaccines became more regularly used. Mm-hmm. And that changed the life expectancy from about 35 to 80. And so I was wondering if there was any correspondence with cocaine being in Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, it was removed after night in. In 1903, cocaine was removed from Coca-Cola, so about the same time, so the vaccines are what, you know, changed the life expectancy, but I'm sure they're not being any cocaine in Coca-Cola helped. Just a little bit. Just a little, I bet. Uh, so yeah, they weren't having cocaine. Uh, to answer your question. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to hear the rest of the items that were used for remedies? Yes. Cream of tartar. <laughs> Aconite. Laudanum. Probably said that one wrong for sure. Camphor. And gold solution. Don't know what gold solution is. Doesn't it's just sound like, healthy. Sounds like someone just scraped like a gold bar or something and just threw a few flakes and like Vaseline. You just rub it on your skin. <laughs> <laughs> These were prescribed to overcome conditions that prevented proper digestion and assimilation of needed nutrients from the prescribed diet. The aim of the readings was to produce a healthy body, removing the cause of the specific ailment. Readings would indicate if the patient's recovery was problematic. The waiting list to see Edgar Casey was extensive and sometimes people would have to wait months. Lumenthal and Brown went ahead with ambitious plans for a university as a supplement to the hospital and a parallel service for the mind and spirit. It was to open on September 22nd, 1909, nope, 1930. (laughs) During the Great Depression, Edgar would turn his attention to spiritual teachings. In 1931, Edgar Casey's friends and family asked him how they could become psychics like him. Out of this seemingly simple question came an 11-year discourse that led to the creation of study groups. From his altered state, Edgar relayed to this group that the purpose of life is not to become psychic, but to become a more spiritually aware and loving person. Study group number one was told that they could, quote, bring light to a waiting world, unquote, and that these lessons would still be studied a hundred years into the future. Well, he wasn't wrong, actually. The readings were now about dreams, coincidence, developing intuition, the Akashic records, astrology, past life relationships, soulmates, and other esoteric subjects. Have we looked up Akashic on the podcast before? Nope. Hold on. Because it sounds familiar. Ah, someone asked me if they were offensive. I remember. Because they had never heard the word, and I think a YouTuber was using them. Mm. I think they were wondering- Ah, they were wondering if it was cultural appropriation. 
Okay. Do you know what it is specifically, though? Because I don't really in, know. In Theosophy and Anthroposophy, the Akashic Records are a compendium of all universal events, thoughts, words, emotions, and intent to ever an intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future in terms of all entities and life forms, not just human. They are believed by theosophists to be encoded in a non-physical plane of existence known as the mental plane. Alrighty, thank you. Mm -hmm. What website was that from? Wikipedia. Nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of books have been published about these readings. Hugh Lynn narrowed the mailing list down to 300 members who were genuinely enthusiastic, and as a result, the first annual Congress of the Association was held in June 1932. Association activities remained simple and unpublicized. Members raised a building fund for an office, library, and vault, which they erected in 1940 and 1941 as a single unit added on to the Casey residence. I thought the use of the word erected was... Funny. Silly, yeah. Because I'm actually 14. <laughs> <laughs> nice, Danny. Thank you. Members, no offense to any 14-year-olds, um, but you shouldn't be listening. No, you shouldn't. <laughs> Never mind on that, actually. I know our demographic and no one younger than us listens. That's true. <laughs> I hope. Members were drawn from all religious backgrounds. Edgar's philosophy was, quote, if it makes you a better member of your church, then it's good. If it takes you away from your church, it's bad, unquote. So he was a devout Christian, but he was like, not I'm not trying to convert it. you. Yeah! Yeah, and that's why I like him. He was like, I'm not trying to change you or make you believe in my God. Just trying to make you a better person. And, like, help you with what you're going through. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. The philosophy of the readings was that truth is one, each organization is part of this one. Therefore, the ARE was not to function as a schism or in opposition to any religious organization. The goal of the work was not something new, but something ancient and universal. In March 1943, the first edition of the only biography written during Edgar's lifetime, There is a River, by Thomas... <laughs> Did not look up how to say this last name. S U G R U E. Sugru. Subaru. Oh, no. <laughs> Duh, Thomas <laughs> was published. As a consequence, public demand increased. The office staff had to be increased, and the mail carrier could no longer carry all the mail, so Gertrude got it from the post office by car. Hugh Lynn and Edgar Evan were both away in the forces for World War II, and Edgar coped with the letters and increased his readings to four to six per day. Edgar gained national prominence in 1943 after the publication of a high-profile article in the magazine, Corona? We're going with it, titled Miracle Man of Virginia Beach. World War II was taking its toll on the American soldiers, and he felt he could not refuse the families who requested help for their loved ones who were missing in action. He increased the frequency of his readings to eight per day to try and make an impression on the ever-growing pile of requests. He said this took a toll on his health, and it was emotionally draining and often fatigued him. The readings themselves scolded him for attempting too much and that he should limit his workload to just two readings a day or else these good efforts would eventually kill him. From June 1943 to June 1944, 1,385 readings were taken. By August 1944, Casey collapsed from strain. I was just thinking about tarot readers and how a lot of tarot readers report on fatigue after readings. So this isn't like an isolated incident. Okay. That makes sense. When he gave a reading on this situation, the instructions were to rest until he was well or dead. He and Gertrude went away to the mountains of Virginia, but in September, Edgar Casey suffered a stroke at the age of 67 in September 1944, and died on January 3rd, 1945. 
He is buried in Riverside Cemetery in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Gertrude died three months later. The association continued the work of classifying and cross-referencing over 14,000 files of readings that had been taken throughout Casey's lifetime from March 31, 1901 to September 17, 1944. This year is the 90th anniversary of the ARE, so 2020 is the 90th. Tw- nope, fuck. 2021 <laughs> is the 90th anniversary. Nice. Yeah. Established in 1972 as the Over the Wall Prison Program, focusing on a on the A Search for God study group material, the Prison Outreach Program has been serving. This is from the website from his website. Okay. The Prison Outreach Program has been serving inmates for over 45 years. This important program provides inmates with free books related to the principles outlined in the Edgar Casey readings, plus parallel and alternative material. The Prison Outreach Program receives an average of 650 letters and family requests per month, which is more than all of the other ARE departments combined. We continue to see a growth in the number of requests for this valuable material. Since 2001, our output has doubled. This program is funded solely by donations, which means that the number of books we are able to send is directly related to the number of dollars given each year. ARE runs conferences, retreats, and other educational activities and publishes books relating to Edgar Casey and his teachings under the imprints of the ARE Press and Fourth Dimension Press. The ARE also publishes a quarterly member magazine, Venture Inward. It maintains an affiliation with Atlantic University and runs a health center and day spa at its Virginia Beach headquarters, along with the Casey Riley School of Massage. So, the organization is still active, still doing a lot of good stuff. The only bone I have to pick with them is that they kind of added, like, God and searching for God into stuff, which Uh isn't what he was about. He was like, believe in your own God. But I I don't know, but he also spread the word of Christianity before he created the ARE. So it's hard to say, but I hope that they're still accepting of... Yeah, yeah. And he was like a Sunday school teacher, like he was very involved in the community. But I could see him feeling either way about it. I couldn't, like, I had to be a member to get access to pretty much anything on their website. So I wasn't able to, unfortunately, look into much. But I at least hope that they are still accepting of every other religion the way that Casey was when he was alive. That'd be the best case scenario. Absolutely would. But that is the story of Edgar Casey, the Sleeping Prophet. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So my topic my case it's not really a case is all the time simpsons got stuff right (laughs) i love this um you're not gonna love the first one the i know the first perhaps most famous prediction made by the simpsons is donald trump's presidency initially it referred to trump running for president president as a reform party candidate which i did not know that it actually was a reference at the time the episode was airing to him running um but in two in 2016 it took on a different meaning as a prediction a chalkboard gag the week after the election in 2016 read quote being right sucks unquote (laughs) that's funny yeah that's a really funny reaction Another case of The Simpsons seemingly predicting the future comes from Lisa Simpson accurately guessing the winning team of the Super Bowl. I remember that one. Oh, really? Yeah, I remember that happening. Uh, I'm not into sports or anything, but I remember, like, it being a thing. The first time this occurred, she predicted a Washington team, which I'm not going to say in the name of, would win. The year after this episode... Simpsons staff decided to dub in the name of the competing teams of that year, and were once again correct with their call of the Dallas Cowboys being victors. This method of dubbing in the teams and predicting the winning one continued with moderate success. Okay, that's fun. I think the one that I'm thinking of specifically is, I don't remember the teams or anything, but 
they basically predicted that these two teams were going to the Super Bowl to go against each other. And then the team that they predicted was going to win didn't win. But I think that it came, that like, from what I understand and remember, them predicting that those two teams going to the Super Bowl, that episode aired before thing. it announced that those te- teams were going to the Super Bowl. That's what I remember specifically. Okay. I vaguely remember that, too, actually. Yeah, don't remember when it was, don't remember who, I can't tell you nothing. Don't do sports. I I don't do sports, I'm not telling you not to. I'm just saying that I don't interact with them much. <laughs> That's fair. In a visual gag, there's a line of text that reads under the 20th Century Fox logo, quote, a division of Walt Disney Co., unquote. This was before Disney bought Fox in July of 2018. That's wild. Yeah. Simpsons predictions have also made a foray into the technological side of things. In season 6, they predicted in an episode depicting the future that voice-activated smartwatches would be an occurrence. In 2013, that came to fruition. In a case of The Simpsons contributing to the future, a case of autocorrect being poured on a device in an episode led to Apple employees adding extra effort to a decent autocorrect feature. And it still sucks, so I'm yeah. so glad that The Simpsons had that episode, because what the fuck would I have? Yeah, what was it like before that? If it's anything like, okay... <laughs> It's a huge thing in some of the gaming communities that I'm in where, like, there's this really cool game with some problems, but they don't fix those problems even though they think that they are. They're like, here's a new patch update that adds you can hug your friends now, but then also, like, this thing is kind of fixed, but not really. Oh, and this other function that was completely fine, it's a little worse now. (laughs) So, uh, I'm imagining that that's exactly how that went with autocorrect. <laughs> Not much got fixed. Yeah. <laughs> they also predicted video chats in the same episode. They predicted the smartwatches. In addition, a that's little fun. darker, the, the, they predicted faulty voter machines in which a person votes for one candidate and the machine spits out another. Oh. Yeah. Huh. There was also an episode where one of the plots revolved around Homer's distant relative. I say distant in that he didn't show up much. I think he might have been his stepbrother, half brother, something. Yeah, not uh, the immediate family he gets, of the ants. He gets rich quick off a baby transla- translating app, which is a thing. Well, it's really a thing. Yeah. Like, the cry translator, I think. Huh. That's interesting. No, I believe this one is another case of The Simpsons impacting real life, as Homer has a get-rich-quick scheme that involves stealing grease and selling it. The article refers to it as a plan so prolific that people in New York were seen doing the same thing. Stealing grease? From restaurants and selling it. Oh. What? That's super yeah. weird. And gross. Yeah, very disgusting. In a two-for-one, the Simpsons accurately predicted Germany winning FIFA, but unfortunately, they also predicted the corruption found within the FIFA employees, which would take place later in real life. So after the episode aired, a <laughs> bunch of scandals broke about, a like, bribes being taken and corruption within the FIFA employees. Oh my god. So they can predict stuff, but they're like there's gonna be good and bad to it. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Um, Interesting. In the second season, Marge Simpson Simpson reveals she sent Ringo Starr fan mail in high school, and the Beatle finally sends a response back. This incident would be mirrored in real life when Sir Paul McCartney gave a reply to a mixtape he had received from two women in Essex 50 years ago. Damn. Yeah. 
What was the response even like? Hey, you guys sound cool. Thanks for sending me this mixtape. <laughs> I don't know. Like, what the fuck? I would, I would be so embarrassed at that point, 50 years later. I don't know. Yeah. I get still wanting to, like, respond to every fan, but at the same time, it's been 50 years. <laughs> Yeah, that was the bit in uh, the Simpsons episode, is that Ringo Starr was, like, was... It wasn't because he was wanting to respond, it's because he was making good on the fact that he, like, told himself he would respond to every single piece of fan mail. Gotcha. That's kind of what I was thinking it was, just like a backlog of stuff. Yeah, that's what it was. That's fun. I like that. Roy Horde? was attacked after an analog to himself was attacked in a Simpson ep- Simpsons episode, and I, he might have died. Who? Roy Horn. I think he was, like, an animal handler. Looking it up. Uh, he died of COVID-19. What the fuck? Roy Horn of Siegfried and Roy. Yup. Yeah. At the age of 75? Anyways, this was from HollywoodReporter.com, so that was incorrect. I apologize. No worries. I mean, he still may have been... Attacked. Harmed by an animal, just not... His death, it appears, isn't... Yeah. In an episode taking place in 2010, the U.S. wins gold in curling against Sweden. In 2018, that matchup occurred with the same result. Another episode had NASA help turn an ordinary person into an astronaut, which was mirrored when the UK held a contest to do the same. Hmm. Uh, Do you think someone at NASA was just a huge Simpsons fan and they were like, we should do this, for real? Isn't NASA, like, American? Yeah, my bad. British NASA. British NASA. I don't know what it's called. There was an episode that mirrored events, and that's what I think, too, actually. Um, <laughs> some of these, I think, was The Simpsons. Inspired so it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone knows what The Simpsons is, recognizes the characters. There was an episode that mirrored events in 2016 when whether or not censoring the statue of David was a good idea. Because his <laughs> schlong is out. Why? Who cares? It was in Russia, I think. So I guess Russia. Okay, so they think that, like, pictures of the Statue of David should be censored. Is- no, I think I was like, t- talking about covering the statue with the cloth. What the fuck? Uh, I'm not sure where the Statue of David is. I don't think it's in Russia. You neither do I. It's in Florence. Multiple science-based predictions happened in The Sim- Simpsons. The first being that Homer's bullshit scribbling in, like, a throwaway visual gag. One of the e- equations was near the mass of the god particle when the math equation in the episode was shown. Lastly, they also Wait, hold on. the existence. You're well, going to have to tell me what that means. <laughs> I don't know what the god particle is. Hold on, I think it has something to do with string theory. Okay. And it's like an all-connecting particle throughout the universe. Hold on. Like if we found it or could figure it out. The model predicts that there are certain elementary particles even smaller than protons and neutrons. As of the date of this writing, the only particle predicted by the model which has not been experimentally verified is the Higgs boson, jokingly referred to as the God particle. Results results obtained by researchers in 2012 recorded observations consistent with the Higgs boson. While subsequent results seem promising, analysis continues as physicists seek further confirmation of the elusive particle. Hmm. 
The God Particle nickname actually arose when the God Particle of the Universe, when the book The God Particle of the Universe is the Answer, What is the Question? by Leon Letterman was published. Since then, it's taken on a life of its own, in part because of the monumental questions about matter that the God Particle might be able to answer. The man who first proposed the Higgs boson's existence, Peter Higgs, isn't all that amused by the nickname God Particle, as he's an avowed atheist. All the same, there isn't really in religious intention behind the nickname. Hmm. So, I think they think it might be something smaller than a proton or a neutron. Right. I understand. And since that's chemistry, I think there was probably an equation involved. Involved. And they just threw random numbers in a bit, and it was actually close to the equation that they needed, is my guess. I think it was physics, but yes. Physics also takes math, it's fine. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Can you believe I took pre-calc? I don't sound like someone who took pre-calc in physics, but I promise you guys I did, and I was great at them. (laughs) I took physics, and the only reason I passed is because you didn't put my last three tests in. I slept through the class and did fine, because I took phys- I took, uh, I took pre-calculus before I took physics, and I'm really good at just understanding scientific concepts on their own, so when you paired them with math that I already knew, class was a breeze. Fair enough. That was my nap class senior year. <laughs> um, lastly... They also predicted the existence of a three-eyed fish near nuclear waste. <laughs> Hold on, what? Specifically that type of mutation occurring in a fish due to the fact that they existed near nuclear waste. I didn't know that this mutation actually happened. Yeah. It was a three-eyed wolf fish. Holy shit. It's kind of cute. I'm pretty sure that it's dead now, which is very unfortunate. I mean, probably, yes. I love science, but I don't like the whole... that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. But that is it, though. Alrighty. That was so fun. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Simpsons, and thank you, Edgar Casey, <laughs> and thank you, you. Stacy. Oh my God, I almost <laughs> forgot. <laughs> well, Sammy may be forgetful, but I would never forget about you, Stacy. <laughs> so sorry, Stacy's Stacy and Stacy's mom. In my defense, I got an OCD meds, and I had to go. We had to go through my text messages to remember what I did throughout the week because it was just gone. Oh. Yeah. Is that common side effect? Oh, yeah. That and diarrhea. Um, <laughs> Speaking of diarrhea. <laughs> I regret all my life choices. <laughs> Leading up to this moment, you regret everything. Uh-huh. <laughs> Hey, Dan, there's a window behind you. Oh, I'm gonna diarrhea right now. Thank you. (laughs) It's not completely dark out yet, so it's not as effective. Uh Uh-huh. It's just at night. I don't feel good about it, but I'm not pissing myself because it's not nighttime yet. Uh, it's nine o'clock. I can still see light. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, from outside. Well, thank you guys for listening. Thank you! <laughs> uh, I guess depending on where you are, good night. Good morning. And, and happy, happy birthday. birthday! Happy birthday! Thank you, Stacy. And Stacy's mom. For you and yours, Stacy's mom. And happy Pride! Happy Pride. Thanks for listening to Everyday Nightmares. If there was anything in this episode that may have triggered you, first of all, we apologize. Second of all, we would love it if you would inform us of what triggered you specifically so that we may provide a warning for it in future episodes in order to keep you safe from any harm that could come to you via listening to this podcast. If you have corrections, questions, or additions, please let us know. 
And if you have stories of your own, you can email us at everydaynightmarespodcast at gmail.com. Please include your pronouns, and if you'd like to have your name read on air in our minisodes, please sign your name at the bottom. You can follow us on Twitter at EDNightmares, Instagram at Everyday Nightmares Podcast, and TikTok at Everyday Nightmares Pod. If you like the podcast, don't forget to like, rate, review, comment, subscribe, or follow wherever you are listening. It is the best way to spread the word. If you'd like to show your support and get a shout out on air, visit our Patreon or Ko-fi. You can get access to bonus episodes, bloopers, and even have the opportunity to pick your own episode topic and or case. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. I wanted to let you know that I found a giant lesbian fan at Spencer's. You mean fan like the one you open and like fan uh-huh. yourself with? Or I've seen them use this decoration. When you said that, I thought you meant just a person who's who a, a fan, fan of, lesbians. of lesbians. Yeah, who just cheers it them was on. Me. <laughs> it was me. I well, am you, simultaneously you a lesbian, a lesbian you can be and a fans big fans of, fan lesbian. of lesbians. But I, I just, for, for some reason, I was imagining someone who's not lesbian just really cheering on lesbians. <laughs> Just the most supportive ally in the world. <laughs> That'd be nice. It would be nice. I also found a plush Bowser that I got from this. I saw a Mewtwo Super. hat a couple of years ago there. Uh, it was ugly as fuck. Which was oh, unfortunate. The, the snapback? It was a Mewtwo snapback. The Bowser was at a different store. Oh, okay, gotcha. Spencer hats are really ugly usually the snapbacks yeah the two no offense but i am okay. not a fan yeah there's some there's some cute stuff there but there's definitely most of the hats just aren't my style at all because i strictly wear dad hats uh so anyway <laughs> but mewtwo was like one of my favorite characters when i was one of my favorite pokemon probably actually my favorite pokemon when i was a child oh yeah So anyway, thanks for listening, you guys. Bye. Bye.